News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukat Ali. And top of the morning to you, this is Newsline. We're live, as always, from the News First studios in Dawson Street in Clamble. And uh, this morning we have got a presidential candidate with us. That's right, he's right here in the studio and he is Dr. Rohan Palewatte from the National Development Front. Here he is. Very good morning to you, Dr. Palewata. Very good morning to you. And welcome to News First Newsline. Sure. Um, doctor, you are a, um, shall we say, a somewhat successful businessman. You um, employ people. Sure. You um, uh, export out of Sri Lanka. Yeah. And uh, by all accounts, quite successful. So, why politics? Well, um, as you rightly said, I can retire tomorrow as a you know, successful entrepreneur. Right. But then there, are, there comes a time that you question the purpose of life. And then when uh, you know, things are not, because now whatever we do, the, even the business that I'm doing, mm -hmm. I believe it is in the micro environment. And the macro environment is handled by a bunch of politicians. Right. And what is happening in the macro environment affects the businesses that we do in the, the micro environment. So the answer is to challenge the mic macro and take the reins into your hand. Mm -hmm. And also it's a matter of consciousness. Because when all the in indicators yeah. indicate that the country is, not, is being mismanaged at the highest level, we cannot expect it to you know, change by an accident. Mm -hmm. Unless people like myself intervene effectively, it will go unabated. So this is the reason for me to have crossed over to the morass of politics. On Newsline, we encourage your questions by SMS, please. 0772-300-305. Card coming up on your screen right now. And of course, we are in conversation with presidential candidate, Dr. Rohan Pallewatta. That's rather noble. Um, what's the profit? Is there a profit? Well, the profit is, of course, the redeem in the country. Because uh, now even myself, against all odds, I have managed to, you know, I have had the will and the courage to penetrate through all the obstacles and okay. establish my business. But if I had the, you know, the, any, any successful country has a band of entrepreneurs, but in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, most of the entrepreneurs who are trying to establish their businesses, mm. the environment is not, not conducive to them. So therefore, um, whether coming into politics, whether it's a profit, of course it's an investment. Because mm -hmm. you're trying to create a conducive environment yeah. for other entrepreneurs to come up and play a role. We are trying to create a level playing field for everyone uh, to come up, come up and start their own businesses. because. Some people who strive really hard mm. to get their vehicle, get their housing, which, which even these fundamental, you know, things they cannot. Uh, the people who go to Melbourne or some other city mm. within one year, uh, they resolve all these problems. Right. Right. Well, um, <coughs> Doctor uh, Palewata, I want want to ask you this: Is, in your observation, um, is politics a rich man's game or is it a rich man's responsibility? I would rather say it's a rich man's responsibility. Well, but you need to be rich. Well, in the present context, if you are speaking the hard truth, yes, you have to. Because the amount of money that you are compelled to spend for example, now I will not name the paper. Uh, we had our launch on the 25th of, uh, uh, you know, September, mm. and then I wanted a supplementary cover page as an advertisement, yeah. and they quoted me 1.2 million rupees. Right. And then once the dates for elections were fixed, they said now it is election rates, and the same advertisement would cost me 4.3 million. And then after two days prior to my advertisement, they call me and tell me, now it is 14.3 million. So 
somebody didn't want you sorry didn't, of course somebody I didn't, didn't want to give you the uh give no, you i did not plot. think that they were trying to buy me i mean that that's a, that's a rate in the market so so you've been gazumped yeah of course i mean i i i did not i did not go ahead with, with the advertisements right because the person who earns legitimately will think 100 times before he spends mm. it's not that i can you know manipulate the stock market or whatever mm. and there is uh, i'm not making money through deals mm. i'm making money through manufacturing so when you have that kind of money you you tend to think 100 times than a person who's having money uh, from the you know corrupt you know i heard i heard the opposite from another candidate that candidate said he didn't really have much money yes so is it true that uh, candidate pallewata and candidate senanaika and uh, candidate whoever else will be joining hands well that is that, that is what i have been uh, striving hard mm. because rather than splitting the the uh, you know vote base mm. that has come up for the alternative forces or alternative uh, you know ideology i i think uh, if we can come together that is the best thing but then on the other hand there are the difficulties such as now i have been because in sri lanka once the elections are declared mm. always we had 15 to 20 candidates coming forward right. and uh, you know handing out nominations but uh, for the first time in the history 35 people have submitted their nominations this time mm -hmm. but uh, if any person 3 years prior to the presidential election had come out and pronounced loud and clear that i'm going to contest the presidency mm -hmm. and i'm going to challenge the system i have to very humbly say that it was myself mm. so and therefore yes and therefore was the uh, not getting together yes was it a question of who the leader would be well that is that is part of part of the problem but then i have very clearly stated although i started 3 years ago in order to you know meet the aspirations of the people mm. it's finally the aspirations of the people that should reign i have said i am ready i am amenable i am i i can even take a step back in order to bring this whole people together it is often said that the politicians shouldn't be businessmen uh because businessmen know what they're doing and politicians apparently <laughs> don't yeah, you 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 are a businessman aspiring to be in politics how, how does that fit in well i think all the wealth of experience that you bring in from you know because doing an international business is not an easy thing because now i started by exporting only to japan my product only yeah. to japan yeah but now right now i am i am supplying 17 different countries right including china and india so whenever you penetrate a country with your product you are conquering that country in terms of your pricing in terms of your of your quality in terms of your delivery unless because if they have that internally why would they buy from me so the moment that you enter a country with your product which means you are conquering that country right so therefore that experience will augur well in running a country in managing a country okay so there are so many parallels in running a international business sometimes managing a country like sri lanka yeah is might be much easier than managing an international business send us your questions on um, by sms or 0772 300 we are in conversation with presidential candidate dr rohan palewata doctor i want to ask you this question is it a question of ego or is it uh, is your conscience stirred enough that you want a change in sri lanka are you not are you not um, taken aback by fighting the establishment we have uh, on the one main side we have candidate um gotabe rajapaksa yeah. and on the other main side yes. we have candidate sajit premadasa yeah. uh, who has a name that's yeah. uh, you know it's a big brand name sure uh, are you not are you not frightened not at all because uh, first i have to say that is, this is not a egocentric journey right uh, now before i mean there was a background 
as to why before entering into and raising my hand yeah. and saying that I would contest for presidency. There's a background to it. It did not come out of shallow, you know. And uh, the, this, this document, yeah. the manifesto, right. and this is the blueprint of the country. That's the blueprint. Yeah. And this was developed not by myself, by, you know, Professor Dehere Goda, Professor Krishan Dehere Goda, uh, and a think tank, mm -hmm. right? And when I got this document, I scanned it in my, in my mind because in my life, I have always delivered what I promised. So therefore, I wanted to see whether what is written here can be delivered. Can, 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 it, can I make it a reality? Okay. So it is only when I was confident 100% that this can be done, that this could be delivered, that I raised my hand and said, okay, I'm going to contest for presidency. So what are the main issues that you have identified and that you want to change? Well, we have, we have addressed uh, all the areas like education, health, uh, transportation, all these areas we have addressed. And where education, or as we, I think, as in India, they call it yeah. human resources development. Sure, sure. What, do you, what is wrong? What needs to be done? Well, before coming into answering that question, I would yeah. say how, as to how I recognize the role of the executive of this country. Right. Because the executive of this country is elected by the direct mandate of the people. And the legislature is once again elected by another direct mandate of the people. So the role of the executive will not be policy formulation. It will be the role of the, you know, the legislature to formulate the policies. And the supervisory role will be, of course, lying with the executive. Mm -hmm. So as to how, what, what is the criteria that I would adopt yeah. in supervising these uh, policies? One thing, if the, air, if the air that we breathe, the air quality drops or else the water gets contaminated, right? Or there is, uh, you know, pesticides or anything getting into our food. Mm. And if you are losing the green coverage of the country, mm. and if it is a threat to the sovereignty of the country, then I do not think these policies should be approved or executed at all. Right. So that is the basis in which I will be looking at uh, the, the policies that is coming from the legislature uh, as the president of the country. You once said, that you, if you were to be elected president, yes, you would resolve the debt crisis. Yeah, that's right. How that will you manage to do that when um, the established politicians yes. and the established uh, administrators uh, have clearly failed to do that? Well, when I said uh, this three years ago, yeah, I was actually talking about restructuring the debt and. Uh, at the time when I said this, made this statement, our external debt was 46.2 billion US dollars. Okay. Out of that, the Chinese component was around 10 billion US dollars, right. for which we were paying a very high interest rate. Right. So what I was trying to point out is that there are sources where you can get you know, funds at a lesser interest rate. Yeah. So I was suggesting a loan swap. And people might say there are loan agreements and you can't defy them. But then, if you see, Mahathir Mohammed, when he was elected Prime Minister recently, in, when, in his 90s, he travelled to China and he said, these are the, pro these are, he may name a few projects that is happening in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And he said, we cannot pay these projects. So he was standing with the national interest. So I think a leader with a personal leader, I mean, of course, there can be agreements, mm. debt agreements, but then you can always request the counterpart, your countries who have entered into these agreements mm. to revise, right? Of course, you have to have the political will and you have to have the national interest in your heart. Uh, I want to ask you this question. I hope you don't construe it as being personal. It's not. We, uh, we ask uh, difficult questions on uh, Newsline and that's why we, uh, this program is here. Um, because we want answers for yeah. and on behalf of the people, per pro the people. On that note, can you tell me, are you a billionaire in rupee terms? If you take my assets, yes, uh, yes, I'm a billionaire okay. in rupee terms. And I, of course, I have to say I have declared my, you know, handed over my assets declaration. Which you have to as part of the... Exactly. I have uh, already complied with that. Yes. yes, okay. Now then, my, the point I'm asking you is this. I've been told that the fastest way to become a millionaire 
is to start off as a billionaire and enter politics. Is that about true? Or is it the other way around in Sri Lanka? But in Sri Lanka, it's the other way around that has been happening. Right. But for a person like myself who have, uh, you know, made my mark as an entrepreneur, yeah. um, and if you are getting into principled politics, what you said is true. A right. billionaire can in no time but, become... But in Sri Lanka, it is always the... Uh, it has been the other way. People end up... Exactly. Um, billionaires. You know, from, from bicycles to a Maybach. Yes. That's right. So that, that's, that, is that's exactly, sort of that is exactly the system that we are challenging. Okay. That is exactly one of the reasons that for me to have entered politics. But, you know, I want to say this. There was a group, yes. um, the Maharaja group, can, yes. I dare say, can make more money. And we've been uh, with all the governments yes. uh, that have been here. And in spite, and despite all that, uh, the group has been rebuilt not once but twice. It was built once and since 1983 the group has been rebuilt. Right? So uh, most people build a business once. Yes. Um, our chairman built it twice. Sure. So wh what I'm trying to say is that but on our own yeah. we've challenged the system. Yeah. We've exposed corruption. We've exposed nepotism. Uh, conflicts of interest and all sorts of jolly things that sends the advertisers south. Sure. Okay? And on top of all that, we are backed by clergy from across the ecclesiastical divide and by the common man. And yet we are going on because we have a commitment to uncovering the truth, to creating a level playing field, an equitable land for all. Is this what you are attempting to emulate? Are you, is your conscience with that of the people? Exactly, exactly. And I really appreciate what uh, your organization is doing because now most of the uh, you know, m media, they are not playing it fair. You think so? so? Definitely. Well, you know. It, it, it is evident. Because uh, I'm thankful to the time that your organization has given, uh, you know, as a presidential candidate from the inception. Uh, so this is not happening with uh, many of the media, you know, today. So it's very unfortunate. Now, that, what is the biggest, what's number one? Let's say uh, there are many questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please keep sending them in. 0772-300-305 by SMS, please. Uh, not on WhatsApp because you can't keep changing. And we are in conversation with Dr. Rohan Palewata from the National, um, what is it? Development called? Front. National Development Front, NDF. Now then, Doctor, what is the single most thing that, what is the most pressing issue that you have identified? Well, what is right, it? right now I think we are in an economic deadlock because now the biggest, uh, you know, debt repayment installment will come next year. And I brought this to the notice of the authorities three years. Yeah. Le leadership is not about recognizing the danger that is tomorrow, but recognizing it in much in advance. Right. So now, for me, if you say, okay, how are you going to manage the economy? How are you going to get come out of it? Yeah. I believe the quick fix would be to have, as foreign direct investment, at least 10 billion US dollars within a span of 12 months. That is not just to bring it and put it in the stock market and take it the next day. Yeah. But as foreign direct investment. So what what have I done about it? I have you, look, you look very sincere. Yes. So I'm really interested in knowing what you intend doing about this. Yes. Now I have, during the past three years, I have traveled the world. I have uh, been, you know, meeting people like uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. For on behalf of your company or for on behalf of the people of Sri Lanka? On behalf of the people of Sri Lanka. Okay, carry on. And then, of course, I met the king of Rasal Khaima, then some politicians from Japan, then, then, as I said, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, and then uh, Mr. Jeremy Hunt, who was the Foreign Secretary, uh, several times, not once. So they have introduced many people to start their operations in Sri Lanka. But the investor signals that we are sending out is not right at the moment. It is not conducive. What are and these signals? Because, I mean, they, the moment they come, they will put to a line ministry. Yeah. And at the very outset, they will want to know the commissions that they get. 
because for investment there is there is a competition in the world there is no compelling reason as to why a person should come and invest in sri lanka mm. Mm. so through my contacts i have managed i mean to get you know pledges for around 4 billion at the moment right around 4 billion at the moment mm -hmm. so then that is 4 billion of course 4 billion dollars right and then this is myself not even being in a prasheshya sabha so as a presidential candidate i can proudly say that i have done my homework so that is one of the priorities because if you are head of the state that as i mean if as in my private capacity if i can get pledges for about 4 billion i cannot see the amount that you can bring in if you are head of the state okay um i've i'm going to take some of the questions now or just take one i just want to uh, get the spirit of the thing going sure um the message says that uh is a 23 year old from down south he wants to know what you are going to do one of the questions is already you already answered yeah. which is why you're not joining the others sure. and you know splitting the vote and so on the other is that he wants to know what you're going to do about all these people who have been charged or who have been involved or investigated investigated with corruption and he, uh, he says it's four and a half years yes and all we've heard is talk and sure. a few uh people in remand and out sure what do you intend doing about that well i think um, there shouldn't be any political inf interference in the course of justice rule of law should prevail it is not just words everyone will say rule of law yeah but it should in fact happen in this land and you should not interfere politicians should not interfere uh in 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 the rule of law do you agree that uh do you agree with the um uh, with the ability of the uh, executive president to grant clemency in some cases uh, after a conviction well so far as to how that has been used it is a matter of as to how you use that uh, authority well, we had yeah. we had some politician sure. whose uh, wife was convicted of murder yeah. only to be given a presidential pardon exactly so that that cannot be accepted right so therefore if there is an authority that it it can be minimal that it can be abused i do not think that we should give any authority of that nature to any person but are you confident of the of the independence of the entire process the the judiciary yes and including for example the the police yes are you so confident that you believe that all judgments reached uh will are safe and therefore you can uh lock them up for ever and a day or even uh the death penalty but that's a separate question sure. what about the first well uh, i think it's a uh, the the system itself is so corrupt at the moment it will be a gradual transformation it is not going to take place overnight you can't say from tomorrow onwards everything is going to be fine so it it will be a gradual transformation and the example should come from the top from the executive himself and once he sets the example it will cascade down uh, to the bottom because one of the researchers in one of my team members say if the corruption involved in government procurement yeah by 50% yeah the economic growth of the country will go up by 2% so that is the amount of corruption that is taking place at the moment so therefore it has got into the system it's like a cancer so we have to take that cancer off without the you know death of, death of the patient right um uh somebody is saying here a proper businessman will start to rebuild the country by negotiating the outstanding loan to be paid on easier terms this way play for time and drive exports and tourism hard to make a difference leave alone all unnecessary expenditures to be stopped does that sound like a good plan very good plan because now uh the former auditor general Mr Gamini Vijay Singh he yeah. says the, he 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 uh, simplifies the problem that Sri Lanka is facing he's saying that uh, the government expenditure for a single day is 7 billion rupees right and the income is 5 billion right so now in my business as to how if you ask how do i make profits even the entire world is watching because this is the first time that in this part of the world that we are manufacturing this kind of high quality product so in order for me to make profits 
I have to breathe and live, you know, lean concept. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I have to eliminate all the waste that is there, all the unnecessary processes. Mm -hmm. It is only then that I can make profits. So if you can bring that lean practice into the management, into the governance of this country, as Mr. Garmini Vijay Singh says, if the expenditure is 7 billion and income is 5 billion, I mean, within a month, we can maybe person with a lean management, you know, who, who lives lean, mm. can uh, fix that immediately. Um, it's another question here, very, very valid uh, question here. It says um, that there are still mafias in the public sector, including the judiciary. How, how do they want to know how you're going to arrest all these? Well, as I said, it, it, it's, it has to happen gradually. Right. Now, for example, you take one example, you, the salary scales of the people in the judiciary. Yeah. Say, I'm not naming any judges, or I'm not naming any no. person. Supposing to get into the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal level, you need to be a career practitioner. I mean, you, 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 you have spent at least 35 years of your career. Yeah. So once you get there, you have children of, you know, who are doing their higher education, hmm. or you might have health issues. And the salary that you receive is insufficient to how, meet how those ends. Uh, I honestly don't know how much a judge of the Supreme Court gets. Uh, I think it's about, uh, I'm not talking about allowances, but no. I think it's about 150,000, right? Do you, so, uh, there was a question somebody asked me yesterday, yeah. uh, said, do you agree that if the, pra if the salary of, if starting right from the local area, yeah. the big the big man, the big chief is the grammar Sevaka there, that if the grammar Sevaka's salary was something like 65, 75,000 a month, yes. then everybody there will be clamoring to get there and so that you will actually have hopefully the best grammar Sevaka for that area. Yeah. And if that is replicated, that is the start. So do you agree that politicians, our legislators, our public service officials, our key personnel, like the head of the army, navy, the, you know, the forces, the police, should be paid top of the line salaries. Definitely, I mean, uh, definitely, I, I endorse that and I agree with that. And do you think that they will then they can then take away all the benefits? Why don't you? Ju well, isn't that what happens in places like Singapore and so on? Exactly. That is that is how they, they develop Singapore because at the time. Uh, I think that was they, they were playing the legislators the highest salary in the world yeah and uh, and then on the other hand they were you know tightening up screws on corruption I mean you live with your salary you're getting a handsome salary you learn to live with that and any corruption is not you know condemned I mean they're punished severely would you would you agree with the viewer who says that government ministers should be banned from travel until the country gets back to normalcy well, certain ministers, of course, will have to have foreign travel because we cannot develop our country in isolation. Right. We will definitely need uh, foreign assistance and we will need foreign dialogue. We will need diplomacy. For those purposes, of course, a few ministers will have to travel. When they travel, do you, do you agree that they need to take uh, a big um, entourage with them? It depends on the purpose of travel. Supposing, now, if you're going to have a meeting with some entrepreneurs in that particular country yeah. would be investors and if you if you can take some people who, who can be their investment partners in Sri Lanka taking them is fine because as long as the con as you because you have to do a cost benefit analysis mm. before you take them right so that is what is not happening because you just take some entourage and sometimes you don't know the value kind of value that they will they bring back to the country so that is where this lean concept comes in where you check everything before you or, you know, practice. Dr. Palewata, how are you going to rebuild people's confidence in the judiciary? Well, I do not see, now, I do not see that it has deteriorated to the extent that some people are trying to say. Because if you, if you analyze the judgments that has been, you know, even, even regarding the, you know, some ju judgments regarding politicians, I mean, it's, it's apparent that justice has been delivered. And Dr. Palewata, this is part of all the questions coming in. There's a call by the majority to ab abolish 
the presidential system. What's your take on it? Well, I have a completely different view. I'm sorry because now, when I, as I said, yeah. when I received this document, when I was thinking whether it is doable, yeah. of course you need some authority to do it. So I was thinking of the executive powers of a president yeah. to implement this. So for a person, because every person has his own management style, for myself to implement this program, to take this natural blueprint forward, I would definitely need executive powers. So personally, I am for executive presidency. Uh, somebody here says critical, two critical questions. What are your plans for, one, the Middle Eastern Sri Lankan maid situation, the, the talking about the domestic, the export of domestic labor, yeah. and two, the future of the tea plantation sector. Sure. Now, politicians shamelessly say that the highest income earner of Sri Lanka for the past so many years yeah is the remittances that we get from our sisters and mothers who are there in the Middle East. Yeah. And once again, the tea pluckers, most of them are female. The 52% of the, of the population are from the fairer sex in this country. Mm. And then even the garment, garment factories, yeah. most of them are females. So we have to salute the contribution that they are. But while saluting, what are we doing? Exactly. Now what I'm trying to say is Look at the social cost on the other hand. While shamelessly politicians are saying you know, we are generating this much of income, look at the social cost because when the children are abandoned at a time when they need the love and warmth of a mother, you cannot teach these children yeah. what is compassion, what is kindness because they have never experienced it in their life. So there are hundreds of thousands of people, children that have been brought up without the warmth and love of a mother. So we have to, you know, bring an end to this system. Of course, you have to face it out by, uh, you know, re replacing it, right? Providing employment, adequate employment, bringing in more manufacturing, uh, you know, facilities to the country mm. so that people will have a, you know, decent life. And uh, of course, we have to go into agri-based industries, right? We have 70% you know, of the people are, you know, if you go to rural areas, they are engage in some kind of agricultural activity. So, but they are not thinking of agri-based industries. Of course, the state will have to take the lead. So my answer to that question, mothers going to Middle East, mm. right? We have to face it out. We have to bring it to an end because the social cost is much more. So instead, what, instead, what yes. would you do? Export professional labor? Yeah, because now if you send a white person for a white collar job, yeah. right? And that is much more feasible you know, than what they collectively bring to the country. Rohita from Gampa um, has got a splendid question. Do you have enough exposure in rural areas? I see your campaign has concentrated mostly on the internet. I think any person who's uh, crossing over to politics yeah. will have this, this challenge. Getting your message across because now as a new party, we don't have the same, we cannot match the mechanism of the main parties. Mm -hmm. But we have, uh, you know, done everything possible. Now we have more than 14,000 grams of our divisions. So far we have managed to identify our agents in all these 14,000 grams of our divisions. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying that it is a well-oiled mechanism. There are some people who are really efficient and working and they are taking the message across. Mm -hmm. So it's a daunting task. Okay. Yeah. But then we are not rattled or we are not, uh, you know, our determination yeah. is intact until we change because this is a journey, right? So people are gathering and it doesn't matter the number number at the moment. Of course, that election numbers would matter. Mm -hmm. But then what we are propagating to cleanse this entire system and hand it over to a talented young bunch of people, right? So that is our idea. That is our march forward. That is what we are fighting for. Until we realize this, we will keep moving forward. Says here, um, we'll ask you this question first. Is it fair to say that to have peace, when I mean peace, yes. I mean an equitable um, lifestyle for everybody, yes. uh, irrespective of uh, caste, creed, and so on. 
to be ready for that and to have that, shouldn't you be ready for war? Well, I, I because I do not agree on that, because. Uh, I think this is leading up to the next question. Yeah. What is your national security policy? Because if there's no peace, yes, there can't be anything else, really. Well, personally, yeah, I I believe uh, army, navy, and the air force, the tri forces of this country, are one of the best in the world. Yeah, and I have been you know, advising them and I have been part of their training programs and in the strategic level yeah. with all these institutes for the past 10 years. Yeah. And I have received, you know, highest, you know, awards from all three, three institutes. So whether you like it or not, the executive of the country will be the commander of, commander in chief of the armed forces. So in that sense, I think I have a fair knowledge about the national security, about national security than the previous presidents of this country. I have been working very closely with these establishments. Mm -hmm. So the f one thing that we should look into is our maritime security. We should, we should uh, spend and we should uh, you know, uh, have more surveillance because all infiltration that is happening. Even it was taken away from the Navy and handed over to a private company. And that chairman is being remanded in, pr in the system. That is why exactly. So we need we need state intervention because we need surveillances because we do not have adequate uh, crafts to you know because we have uh, our our exclusive economic zone is eight times bigger than the country itself. So we need to protect this exclusive economic zone and we have to use it to the maximum. And also when it comes to national security, I mean, what is the threat? We have to understand. We have to have a threat assessment, mm. right? See, suppose if we get all the modern equipment. Yeah. We increase the army, but if one of these major powers like India or China decides to attack us, I mean, can we withstand that? So it's a matter of policy decision. Are we going to be like Israel mm -hmm. and you know be uh, a power where you can even challenge the superpowers, mm -hmm. or else having a mediocre army, having you know, even on the fourth of uh, February, we display all this armory. That we have purchased under, you know, some, some from some country. Mm. So I believe. We, why are we doing this? We have probably to, much of the money borrowed. Exactly. So why are we doing this? Is it because other countries are also d displaying this on their uh, national independence days? So therefore, we have better things to display. For example, what will protect us is the, in in one sense, the, the tripitaka. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm saying, saying something very controversial. Yeah. The Tripi, Tripitaka, then our history written in Mahavansa. These are our you know, pr protectors. It is not the arms that we have purchased by paying exorbitant uh, amount of money. If it is manufactured in Sri Lanka, of course we can display. That's fine. You can, we can show, your, show our might. But these are some you know, borrowed equipment. We are trying to display and we are saying this is our independence. We've got a great question here. Whatever happens at the presidential elections, Dr. Pallavatta must get into the cabinet. The question is how? Well, uh, many people have suggested, but the only thing is, as I said, even bringing in the investment that has been promised, I mean, they will look as to which government is in power. And if that government cannot create a conducive environment for investment, mm. Even if you get in there as a cabinet minister, it will be difficult to get this investment that has been pledged. In Sri Lanka, is there a culture of political forgiveness? The reason I'm asking is it's linked to this last question uh, that I've just taken up, which is that somebody saying here that whatever happens at the presidential uh, election, you need to get into the cabinet. And the question was how. For the question to be how, um, the last time somebody ventured into politics, please yes. say it out, Sarat Fonseca, the, when he ventured into politics, for his attempts, he was well rewarded. He ended up uh, in jumpers at Wellicada. Now, that's what I mean about 
no culture of forg forg political forgiveness. Yeah. So do you think that if incoming government will look at a, any candidate who's uh, not been successful in, at the presidential, do you think that they, they might be mature enough and politically savvy enough and to have the vision to choose somebody like that to join a cabinet? Well, after the elections, I, I, I doubt. But before the elections, if I say what is happening now in the ground, yeah. I have been invited by both main camps right. to join them. But then I came out opposing the political culture created that, by this. I want to ask you that. Yes. A, because you have your own funding. Yes. So was that because they wanted to attract your funding? Or was that to stop you from uh, splitting the vote even further? Or was there a genuine need to have you on their team that you can make it? Or worse still, is it because they are trying to uh, make false promises? What is it? Well, I think one thing is because numbers will count at the next election, right. definitely. Because everyone is you know, skeptical about getting 50% of the vote. So any number would matter. So I think that is the main reason that they are inviting, you know, for me to join them. But I came out opposing these two main camps. So it's a matter of consciousness and it's a matter of integrity. So what happens in uh, politics, because one of the main politicians, when he spoke to me, I said, I came opposing your party, right? How can I join you? It's a yeah. matter of consciousness. It's a matter of integrity. Then he said, come on, Rohan, this is all about politics. So which means the politics of Sri Lanka has come to a level where integrity does not matter anymore when it comes to politics. So that is exactly the culture that I'm opposing. So you are, you are opposing the culture of hypocrisy? Definitely. Dr. Ryan Palewata, do you know, I, uh, I'm, so, uh, I'm so glad that you came on the program, of course, but I'm uh, uh, saddened that we are in our last minute. Um, so we've had an interesting time. Tell me, do you honestly feel or do you, can you disclose whether the three main independents yes. are going to join hands together? You with uh, the former army commander, Mahesh Senanaka, for example. Will you be joining? Well, it's open to everyone because uh, I have already made a statement saying that to meet the aspirations of the people, I'm even ready to take a step back. But that is all what I could do. And then if, if that is not the case, of course, then I will have to go to the next option, and th which means I will have to stand by the people who have gathered around me during the past three years, and I have to go ahead and contest elections. Very sadly, it's the end of uh, the, our time. But uh, Dr. Ron Palevat, I wish you all the very best in your endeavors. I, I do hope that uh, you will be able to convince uh, Sri Lanka that you are the answer. Thank you for being on Newsline. And that's the way it Thank was so on much. Newsline. And uh, we do hope that you enjoyed uh, the program. Thank you for your questions. Do send them in because we can take them up with all uh, the various candidates and their, and all their representatives when they come on the show. And we'll save them and we will do that. And the number is, of course, 0772 300 305. Thank you very much. Enjoy the uh, rest of the day. And, of course, God bless. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali.